Too many people spend their lives wanting to do stuff for God without first allowing God to give them a fresh revelation of who he is. You can take your seats if you want to. I wonder if you could just stay for me, Sam. And do you mind just staying? Because I feel as if we're going to be a bit different tonight. Many people want commissioned. They want a job to do. They want a role or a function or a title. Not for bad reasons, actually. Many of us just like to know what our lane is, right? We don't like messy lanes. I don't mind messy lanes, but lots of people like straight lanes. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah chapter 6 says, I saw the Lord. high and lifted up and his train filled the temple seraphs were in attendance above him or around him each had six wings with two they covered their own faces and with two they covered their feet and with two they flew to one another and they cried out to one another holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And Isaiah says, and I said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips yet my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts then one of the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal which had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs and the seraph touched my mouth with it and said now that this has touched your lips your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out then I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and I said here I am send me And he said, go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. And then said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste, without inhabitant and houses without people, And the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away. And vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remains in it, it will be burned again like a terebrinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 13. God always blesses the public reading of his inspired and his infallible word. And in this moment, I want to just say a few things to you. I want to invite you to behold your God.
turn off your phone. Be present in this moment. You might not have another one like it in your life. Don't be distracted. Don't fill your head with all the things that you need to do. Behold your God. Look at Him. Look at Him. Lift your eyes and look at this God who has come to us. God speaks not in ideas, not in principles, but in a moment in time and history. He speaks into a specific moment in the life of Israel and Isaiah. This member of the royal family, a prophet at the same time as Micah, who was a poor man. And Uzziah had just died. The golden age was over. This man who became king when he was six years old and was one of the best kings of Israel known to be only surpassed by King David and King Solomon has died. Israel stands at a junction. People are uneasy. They're worried. They're anxious. They're frightened. Are we going to go back? Are we going to lose the ground that we have taken? Are we going to end up diluted and disaffected and discouraged once again? You see, they had a long history of bad kings. And in this moment of profound and deep uncertainty, Isaiah, who's already been prophesying for a couple of years, is engaged in his ministry. He started, he's doing it, and he sees God. Have you ever seen God? He sees God. God breaks into this moment and the passage is confused a little if you don't know the background. It's weird that God says to him, go and talk to a people who will not listen. And he says, well, how long do I have to do that? And he says, until the land lies desolate and waste and there's nothing left in the cities. That's because this is spoken to him about 740 B.C., In 722 BC, just 18 or 19 years later, one of the empires that were against Israel swept down over Jerusalem and destroyed much of it. Took 10 of the 12 tribes into captivity. 114 years later, the Babylonians came and they took another section of it until there was nothing left. Jerusalem, the city of God, the place where God's people dwell, this holy place that has so much symbolism for them, ends up a city where women and men are eating their children. They have no water. They have no security. Their buildings are destroyed. Why jackals are running through the streets. And before any of it happens, God says to Isaiah, tell them because they're not listening and they're not going to listen to you Isaiah but you've got to tell them and on that side of history before they see any of that they reject his message they don't want this prophet coming and telling them that they're going to be taken into captivity they don't want that bad news like Jeremiah who was treated the same way but on the other side of history They're able to look back and say, God knew that this was going to happen. God warned us and he told us and he never left us. He may have judged us and he he may have let the Assyrians take us and the Babylonians take us. But all of this stuff happened after God gave a vision to a man of God himself. The seraphs. Many of you will think of these seraphs like little chubby fat children. Seraphs and cherubs, nothing could be further from the truth. That has more to do with 15th and 16th century European art than it does Hebrew and Jewish theology. Cherubs were flaming angels with flaming swords of fire. Two of them were set at the gate of Eden. 
These are fierce, powerful, strong, angelic beings. The seraphs in this story, the word comes from a word that sounds like cobra or snake. They're powerful angelic forces that hold everything around the throne room of God in place. And in this moment of encounter, they can't even look. Two of the wings cover their eyes because they are in the presence of the holy. Two of their wings cover their feet because they don't want to move. And with the other two wings, they bid, they do the bidding of God. Now listen to Isaiah 6, 1 again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. The seraphs couldn't look. The powerful angelic forces couldn't look. This was too great a sight. This was too powerful a sight. Yet God invites Isaiah to behold his God. And the room shakes and the fire blazes and the smoke fills the room in the vision. And Isaiah's first cry is, I am undone. Behold your God. And here's the first thing that will happen. You will realize there's nothing but grace that can keep me in this place. When you really see God, the next thing you see is your own brokenness and shame. When you really see God, you realize, how could He love me? Why would He touch me? Where in His grace and His mercy is the explanation of why He would come and touch someone like me and love someone like me and hold someone like me and give someone like me a chance. But that is exactly what He does. This seraph with a tongue takes a coal blazing hot from the altar and he goes to Isaiah's lips and he touches it. And he says, your guilt and your shame are atoned for. You are cleansed, Isaiah. Oh, hallelujah. Behold your God seated on a throne Come, let us adore him. And then God says, who will I send? And Isaiah says, send me. Take whatever there is in my life and use it for your glory. A fresh mission from God. A fresh purpose, a fresh destiny, a fresh hope, a fresh challenge. But it comes from a fresh vision. You want to change the world for Jesus? Then look at him. Behold your God. Look at Him. Don't glance at Him. Look at Him. This throne room that Isaiah is in is talk, talked about again in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. And the angels adore Him. And the elders adore him and every living thing on earth and under the earth and in the sky adores him and the whole of creation cries out worthy is the lamb who was slain because as John in Revelation 5 looks at this very throne room he sees a lamb that has been slain presumably with blood upon it. Behold your God. Don't just look at a throne room this time. Look at a cross. Look at a man with scars on his hands and on his feet. Look at the crown that is pressed down upon his head. Look at the Jerusalem thorns, which are not that length. And they are not that length. They are that length. They are that length. As thick as a screwdriver. 
and watch. Behold your God. As that crown is pressed down into his head and blood pours down his face. Behold your God as a group of Roman soldiers take strips of leather and tie lead into it as sharp as a knife and laughing start to whip him with it. Most men died after four or five lashes and they lashed him again and again and again and again and again until you could see the bones in his spine. Isaiah said his back was like a ploughed field. Behold your God as they lift a wooden cross and they nail him to it, first forcing him to carry it through the streets of Jerusalem. Behold your God as they lift him up and they drop it into the ground and his bones dislocate and he cries out in pain. Behold your God as his mother watches. And behold your God as he looks not just at the men and the women at the bottom of the cross or the leaders of Israel locked away in the temple. Behold your God and listen as he turns his face toward heaven and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He was talking about them, but he was talking about you. He was talking about me. Don't turn your eyes away from this. Christians want fresh ideas and fresh strategies. They want fresh projects and fresh money and new buildings and fancy lights. We need to see him again. Behold your God as they lift him from the cross. And they wrap him in sheets of linen or cotton. And they carry him to an ordinary tomb that has never been used, bought by a wealthy man probably called, um, well, we're not sure, it doesn't really matter. Probably Joseph of Arimathea. Behold your God who lies there lifeless and formless for three days and then behold your God on the morning of the third day as the sun is rising and the darkness is being pierced he breathes again His lungs begin to work again. His heart begins to beat again. His hands begin to move again. His feet begin to move. The garments miraculously remove from his body and he sits up undisturbed. Behold your God as he rises and walks from the darkness of death into the light of the new morning. Behold your God as he meets Mary and Peter and John and the twelve. Behold your God for 40 days as he walks with them. Behold your God as he has breakfast with them. Behold your God as he prays for them. And behold your God in Jerusalem just a few weeks later as he stands on the mountain and is carried to heaven from the depths of the darkness of despair and hell, the darkest and deepest and lowest place a person can go. He rises. Not just to life, not just to earth. He keeps rising. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. Behold your God, restored to the throne room, standing in resplendent power and glory. Behold your God as he beckons you home. 
behold your God as He looks at you and says, you will finish this race. I will walk with you to the end. Behold your God. You want a fresh vision for God? Get a fresh vision. You want a fresh mission? Get a fresh vision of Him right now. Right now in this room. A few chapters after Isaiah 6, we read this in Isaiah chapter 40. O Zion, verse 9, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord. God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. So don't just finish in the throne room. Let me take you back to that mountain in Jerusalem where he went. And behold your God, because one day he will return. And the clouds will break and the trumpet will sound and the voice of God and of the archangel will be heard. And those who have died in Christ will be caught up to be with him. And so we who remain will be caught up with them and we will be forever with the Lord. Behold your God coming on the clouds. Behold your God ruling in splendor. Behold your God who will never die again. Behold your God who was dead and is now alive and is the Alpha and the Omega. Behold your God who holds the hand in his hands the keys of life and death and healing. Behold your God. And then look at London. Look at the most powerful man on earth, Joe Biden. Look at the one that wants to be the most powerful man on earth, Donald Trump. Look at Vladimir Putin. Look at Keir Starmer. Look at Emmanuel Macron. Look at the leaders of the nations. How do they compare to this God? with all of their power and their might. In 20 or 30 or 40 years, they'll be nothing but a memory. The worms will be eating their bones. Their flesh will be gone. Behold, your God will still be alive, will still reign, will still rule, and nothing will defeat Him. If we as a church want a fresh vision and a fresh mission and a fresh purpose, we see Him again, resplendent in His glory, you're going through university and you want to know what you do with your life, you get a fresh vision of this God. You're working out what you should do, where you should work, how you should live, what you should do with your kids, you get a fresh vision of this God. Let Him fill your imagination. Let Him fill your thinking. Let Him be the first thing you think of when you rise in the morning and the last thing you think of when you go to bed at night. Don't give Him the drag ends of your day or your finances or your time. Give Him your soul. Give Him your heart. Say, take my life and use it for your glory. You'll do that when you behold your God. I invite you tonight. Behold your God. I think God is here. And I think He is here to break open hearts, to stretch imaginations and to call you out of small thinking to remind you that you are not defined by what you are facing. Look at Him first. So as we worship Him, as we exalt Him, as we take time now to come before Him, behold your God. Behold your God. Behold your God. Behold your God. Just look at Him. He is here. He is here. He is not somewhere else. He is here. In words that have echoed around these halls, 
since 1930. The master is here. Ask him to give you supernatural eyes to see through everything else and to see that he is here. at the graveside. He held your hand as the coffin was lowered. He guided the surgeon's knife. He caught your tears in a bottle. saw the heartbreak as you received the divorce certificate. When you lay at night wondering if you would wake it through the morning, he was the one that carried you. When you thought everything was over, he was the one that gave you the gift of another dawn. Behold, your God. When loved ones deserted you and friends walked away, he stood by you. Behold your God. Look at him. Just look at him online, look at him. We magnify your name. 